husband is giving me the I'm tardy look, so I'm going to go ahead and get the service started this morning. Uh, good to be in the house of the Lord. Um, so, you know, as a, I was, I'm finally reading a book that Sarah gave to me, what, three months ago? I'm finally into it, Sarah. Um, it's a book about worship. And the first chapter, uh, it teaches you a Hebrew word for worship in every chapter. And it's amazing. And we'll pass around the worship team. I'm halfway through it already. It's a page turner. And it's an easy read. Um, the very first word for praise is literally extending your hands, lifting your hands in praise. And it's just a word study of each of the different um, words for praise. And it, it struck me that each scripture in the back of the chapter that was kind of a study of this word, almost all of them talked about the night watchman on the wall and the priests that were in the tabernacle through the night. And I really feel like I was stirred in my heart to pray for Mike, uh, to pray for Mike Fox. He has been a watchman on the wall. He has been a, a priest in the night watch for a long time. And he and his family are going through a rough patch right now. And it's our body, it's our, it's our purpose as his church family and the body of believers uh, with him to stand with him and remember him. And, you know, the, the storms come in all of our lives, and we go through those yeah. periods of darkness in all of our lives. And right now, our brother needs our prayers and our support. And, um, you know, we're all called to be, to take up that helm and, and to be the watchman during the night. And that's the hardest job, is to be the one that stays awake when everybody's sleeping and resting, and to be the one that perseveres when all you, everything in you just wants to just rest and to let go. And, and the greatest dangers come in the darkness. And so right now, my prayer is, Lord, light up the darkness in that situation. Let your life and your truth come in that situation, whatever it may be. And um, just, just remember him. And, and I just want to lift my hands when we pray this morning for him and uh, in support and, uh, of everything that's going on with Mike. In Jesus' name, yeah, done. You know, it's, I don't mean this to sound wrong, but I really feel this in my spirit that the Lord has allowed this to happen because he's putting all of us into a position where the seas in front of us, Pharaoh's armies behind us, mm -hmm. and when things look hopeless, yes. Moses said, stand still. Mm -hmm. Stand still and see the salvation <laughs> of the Lord. Yes. Now, it's terrible for the family and for those going through it. But we must and do have confidence that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If we lose that, Satan's won. That is the whole crux of what our salvation is based on. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. And I feel like we really need to just declare yes. stand on the promises of God no fear be not. I can hear the Lord saying be not afraid don't be dismayed yes. and by the way dismayed I looked that up and I thought why, why is that always with afraid that is terror that's beyond afraid that is horrifying don't let any of that come in stand still and watch what I do I parted the sea and they all escaped I wiped out Pharaoh's army, and I'll tell you, when you come against the child of God, the sea's going to open for that yes. child, and yes. the enemy's going to be drowned in the sea. So whoever, whatever has come against them, if they hold on, well, no, they will hold on. I, I'm tired of saying if, if. Salvation is not based on if. It's, right. it's a positive thing that happens. It happened in each one of our lives. And there are people today that live in constant fear of losing their salvation. It's like, that would be like the priests going in every year again and doing the sacrifice. I've been wrestling with all of that. And the Lord, and Paul pointed out so clearly in Hebrews 10 that Jesus went in once and for all. Yes. So that tells me that that sacrifice went forward, it went backward, it went everywhere. Yes. So what am I saying? Every sin, every thought, everything that was contrary to the Lord 
that occurs in a believer's life is wiped out. Yes. It is not put against them. And we live by grace. Yes. By the grace of God. And yes. this will it'll all turn out better than ever. Amen. Jesus name. Amen. 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 Yeah. And let's remember Sally this morning. She's uh, fighting a cough at home this morning. So let's remember to pray for her body for healing. For <coughs> healing over her. Anybody else? Sheila? Continue to remember Evelyn in prayer. Um, she's still in a lot of pain from this leg, this foot that's gotten infected. But she called me this morning and she just wanted me to give a good word here that a prophetic uh, word that had come to her 40 years ago and started to be fulfilled. And she wanted to be encouraged by that and asked us to be encouraged with her that the Lord's fulfilling something that gave her a promise many, many years ago. I thought of Don. He says the Lord's given him things that he's waited years for. And uh, we just know that the Lord is still, you know, still on the throne and still moving. I was thinking of the guy who uh, had leprosy. The first thing that Jesus did is things that totally opposite of what was going on because you weren't supposed to, they were basically outcasts, right? The first thing Jesus did with this guy who had leprosy was he acknowledged him. The second thing he did was he reached out and he touched him. And the third thing, of course, is he restored him to health. And that's what the Lord still wants to do, you know. We sometimes think he's still a God far away, though we hear that he's inside of us, but he acknowledges us, um, he restores us, he reaches out to us, he touches us wherever we are. And, you, know, you know, again, circumstances don't always look promising, but like Don said, our hope is in the Lord. The word hope means our trust, our resilience, not just an expectation, but our real trust. So we just continue to hope in Him, trust in Him, rely on Him, because He's our source and He's our everything. Amen. Amen. We have a couple of uh, people, the lady that I had said last week that had metastatic lung cancer, her best friend has now also been diagnosed with uh, metastatic lung cancer. So if we could continue to remember Heidi and, um, and uh, Brenda in prayer, I would appreciate that. Um, more than anything, I don't know what the relationship with the Lord is. You know, just to turn them, turn them all around and let them acknowledge and remember their Creator. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, just continue prayer from my brother. <clears throat> I think the Spirit is getting through, so that's good. Uh, he's dropped the subject of his. Uh, <clears throat> with my cousin, it's, it's been a while that he's there, and so I think he's basically started to realize that <clears throat> it's a pointless situation. Just drop it and forget about the whole thing. So, continue uh, your prayer that, that that's what's happening. The other thing is, and I, I feel like this is kind of a good news uh, for my family. Both my sister and my nephew uh, left that church that they were in, so that's that's a good thing uh, because they were. I don't know. It, it felt <clears throat> like they were being. Um, I don't know, made to be there. I don't know. There was this. That these people had on, on my sister, that she refused to leave, and then my nephew just finally got fed up with <clears throat> being put down by people there and all the things that uh, were being done to him. So now my sister asked me for prayer the other day that they find a church that they can both go. Um, so I told her that. There's a big need in my mom's church because I don't have a worship team right now. They used to have one. It was young, uh, some teenagers and, and whatnot. And little by little, they've been leaving. So I told her, you know, you can take that worship ministry and blow it up if you actually want to do that. So hopefully, uh, we'll make a decision, but just prayer that the Holy Spirit reveals to them where they're supposed to go. Um, right now, my neck is 18, so he can make a decision to go wherever he wants to, pretty much. Uh, so, 
one thing she was complaining about was that he was only going to church to play drums. And I told her, it doesn't matter the reason, as long as he's there, mm-hmm. the Spirit will take care of the rest. Mm-hmm. That's just, right. just trust and, and, and be glad that he's there. At least. Yes. Yeah. So prayer uh, for that, for them and then for my family in general. Other than that, that's good. That is good. Amen. Yeah. Peter. Um, just pray for my boss. They, they're concerned that she might have cancer again. And so she's going to her some tests about that. Mm-hmm. Let, her, let her know that we as a church be praying for that. Be praying for her. Okay. Yeah, James. Hi, yeah. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry. I had this. I'm going to go around and it's hard. She had all your care and support. And I'm feeling back the car. I'm going to get my energy back. that you have shown yourself faithful in those moments. 
And it's that first step forward into the water, Lord. That is the scariest, Lord. But you roll it back, Lord. And when the battle rages and you need that extra minute, you'll hang the sun in the sky and won't let it move. You'll stop time to give us the victory. Lord, when we go into the cities we did not build, into the promised land that you have promised us, when we go to inherit it, and we see the walls surrounding those strong cities, Lord, we will march and we will praise. We will march and we will praise as your Holy Spirit knocks those walls down as you give us the promises that you have set in each of our hearts. I thank you for the houses we did not build, for the vineyards we did not plant. I thank you for the victory, Lord. Like Elijah told his servant, help us to open our eyes and see. All we see sometimes is the battle. All we see is the enemy. All we see is the sea and the wall. But if we will open our eyes and look, we are surrounded by heavenly chariots doing battle, waging war for us. If we will just believe, Lord, if we will just believe, you have finished it. You have finished it and we simply walk in it. Thank you, Lord, that you have knit this body together, a, a, a body of believers who love each other and will lift each other up through the difficult times, Lord. And right now we lift up Mike to you and his whole family, Lord. We lift up his arms. We lift up his arms as the errand for Moses, Lord. We lift up his arms as he gets weary through the night. We will stand and we will lift up our voices. We will lift up our hands in prayer. We will continue to, to pray the angels round about them of protection, Lord. A hedge of protection. That you light up the darkness, Lord. That truth has its day, Lord. And that victory, victory in all things, Lord. Because we know above all else that you are good. And that you are faithful. That you never leave us. You never forsake us. And we thank you, Lord, for each other, for this body. But most of all, Lord, that you have called us by name. And that you have set before us a purpose and a plan that we just walk in it. You were created. All of us were created for a purpose. And Lord, we will continue to run that race. One step at a time. Sometimes just to stand. But we will continue to run that race side by side, Lord, until you return. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, just a reminder to silence your cell phones if you brought one with you this morning. We, <laughs> trying to lost something new with PowerPoint. Um, we are still seeking media assistance back in the booth. We need uh, sound technicians. We need some other people that know how to do the scriptures. If Sheila, now that Roberto will be leading worship for a time. So um, anybody that's just interested in clicking the scriptures. Uh, let Mike know. And we also need help in Sunday school and with the youth. Um, there's two of us that teach the youth, and now we are going to have to combine the youth and the, um, the younger children together until we have more teachers. So please pray about working with our youth. Yeah. All right. Let go and let God. Yes. Let go and let God. Let's take an offering this morning. Uh, let's see, John, you are a grandchildless today. I want to put you to work. And Don. <laughs> John and Don, please come forward and take an offering for us. Don, you want to ask the best piece? Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to be here today, Lord. We just crave your name. We, we are thrilled to see your mighty power displayed. Your people long for the day that you will move freely among us. We know the enemy is doing everything he can to hold up the messenger of God. But we also know that victory cannot be defeated. It's ours. We just praise your name and we thank you for the day, for all that are here. Lord, we ask you to bless this offering. We ask you to intervene in all the situations that have come before you today. And we will give you all honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I want to echo the sentiment um, that has been expressed this morning concerning Mike, our brother, 
needs our prayers as he goes in the storm. So let's lift them up. <clears throat> but I received the notification that the baton is in pass to me. Of course, the first reaction is, you know, freak out. I mean, this isn't anything that I was expecting to happen anytime soon. Uh, but it's not like I haven't done this before. I uh, <coughs> covered for him when he's out on vacation. Um, and also I've led regularly once a month for the past few months. Because uh, he was trying to prepare me for something. And this was it. This is a great honor to be able to do this. It's also a big responsibility. <coughs> that I don't take this lightly. Um, I am thankful and humbled that these people here, this platform with me, trust me and pastor as well, trust me enough to, <coughs> to take on this task. So, yeah. thank you for that. And thank you, Lord, for choosing me to do this. Amen. All right, well, let's worship. James, are you ready? Mi amigo Santiago.
that we can speak the word of God. To yes, Lord. We are God speak and declare Lord. things in the name of Jesus and the change in their prayer. Yes, Lord. So let's call that right now. Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord.
Thank you, Lord. We bless you this morning. We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. You are a great God. Great and mighty. Hallelujah. Nothing with you is impossible, Lord. We thank you, Lord, even for the faith of Jesus Christ that makes it possible in each and every one of our lives, Lord. We stand on your word this morning. The finished work of Jesus. Hallelujah. We are more than conquerors. We are victorious. And we will see your promises fulfilled in our lives and in our day, Lord, that you would be glorified, that you would be magnified and manifest in Jesus' name. And everybody said, praise the Lord. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Amen. God bless you all. Be seated. Thank you, Roberto. Great job. Thank you, worship team. Appreciate everybody stepping up and uh, doing your part. Praise God. God is good. Amen. Also want to, uh, although Tim and Leah aren't here this morning, I want to thank Tim for uh, standing in for me Wednesday night. We, it was spring break, as everybody probably knows, and we had grandkids. and uh, So, by definition, we had chaos. Praise God. So, Tim stepped up for me, and he preached on Wednesday night, and we had, we had kids everywhere. Praise God. So, praise the Lord. Amen. God bless you. Appreciate everybody being here. Uh, I won't go any further with what we're all uh, dealing with, Mike and his family and that whole situation God knows, and we're just going to trust the Lord that it all is resolved in a way that uh, benefits everybody concerned. Praise the Lord. In Jesus' name, God is greater than all of our situations and circumstances. Thank the Lord. Amen. I was thinking about, we are talking about time. and you know, Time uh, isn't like a straight line. You think it might be when you're younger and you, you just think of life as a timeline. But uh, as you get a little, little older, it's, uh, time's really more of a flat circle. Yeah. You just kind of, you know, things happen that you're not expecting and, and everything doesn't go just as simple and easy as you would expect, but amen. What goes around does come around, and yes. eventually God uh, rewards yes. us for our faithfulness and our trusting in Him. Praise God. So that's the, the great benefit of knowing the Lord, amen, is amen. that we are winners in every situation, no matter what it looks like. Praise the Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. So, praise God. I'm thinking of that circle, and you know, the ratio of an igloo's circumference to its diameter Eskimo pie. Praise the Lord. So there you go. Praise God. I think, therefore I am. I think. <laughs> Praise God. So, amen. Thank the Lord. Appreciate everybody being here. And uh, amen. God's on the throne. And it's all good in Jesus. Praise the Lord. Amen. So let's, uh, let's go right to the Word of God this morning. And uh, we'll begin with Romans uh, chapter 10. I want to read verses 6 through 11. So Romans 10, 6 through 11, Sheila. Good to see Diane back. Praise the Lord. God bless you, Diane. Glad you're feeling better. and The weather's cooperating a little bit anyway. Unless you were at my house yesterday, we had about four inches of snow. It's crazy. I'm telling you, I, I'm so sick of these weather forecasters. I mean, I really, I literally... I have to pray through after one of those. They just irritate me to no end. They're all about putting on a show. You know, it's more about entertainment or something than it is about just give me the weather. And I'm telling you, this winter, I don't think they could forecast which direction the sun comes up. They just, no matter what they say, you got to figure out, tell Sally, just forget it. Turn it off. Because it ain't going to happen anyway. It's going to be something else. You can't, I'd hate to have to live my life where I planned on what the weather was going to do. I'd be in a cave somewhere just having to hunker down till warm weather or something. I don't know. Anyway, enough of my rants. I'm just, the Lord knows. Praise God. Hallelujah. But the, righteous, which is a, the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. So this is righteousness which is of faith speaks like this. Don't say, say not in your heart. Who's going to ascend into heaven? Who's going to go get Jesus? Who's going to make Jesus come down to bring him down from above? Or 
Who's going to descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. We don't do that. We're the righteousness of Christ. That's not what we do. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth. We're not praying for Jesus to come down here and do something. Are you with me? He's already done it. He's given us His Word. So this is how the righteousness of, of faith preach, speaks. The Word is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the Word of faith, which, which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Okay, that's salvation, but that's everything in the kingdom. That's how it works. If that's how you enter the kingdom, that's how you exist in the kingdom. Praise God. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, Whosoever believeth on him will not be ashamed, or will not be disappointed. Right. Praise the Lord. All right. Ephesians uh, chapter 1 and verse 3. So, we're not going up to get him. We're not going down to bring him up. Praise the Lord. The word is nigh thee. So blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Yes. Praise the Lord. So righteousness, that's a faith, talks like this. Don't say bring Jesus down or bring Jesus up or have him come to do something. Amen. The righteousness, that's a faith, says the word is nigh thee in your mouth and in your heart. In other words, okay, so I, I, I'm sick. I need healing. Come to Lord Jesus and heal me. No. He sent His Word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Yes. That's, that's the point we're trying to make. Instead of begging Jesus to come and do something that He's already done, we take the Word of God that He has sent to us to deliver us from whatever the situation or the circumstance might be. Amen? Yes. Now, you know, uh, I, I learned this a long time ago because the first time I ever heard my preach, myself preach on a tape, it freaked me out completely. First of all, the preaching wasn't that great. But even more was the voice that I heard didn't sound anything like mine. Right. I thought, who is that? That's not me. That's somebody else. Right. But the truth is we all have an inner ear and an outer ear. Exactly. When you plug your ears, just try it. Hello. All of a sudden, your voice becomes louder yes. than any other noise around you, right? Because you're hearing only the inner ear. Right. All right? When you hear your voice on a recording... And you think, like, well, that doesn't sound like me. And that's because it's the only time you hear your voice with your outer ear. Right. The rest of the time, you're always hearing it with the inner ear. Right. That's why it's about us. He puts this in our heart, in our mouth, so that we speak it because it carries way more weight when it's our inner voice, our inner man speaking. That's who's connected to the Holy Spirit. That's what's one with Jesus. So when we say it, it isn't enough to just hear it. Hearing it's good. But to speak it yourself, to hear it out of you, brings more truth to it, brings more of a reality to it. That's why we confess the Word. That's why we say what we say, amen, instead of just hearing what somebody else said. It's good to hear the Word. But the reason we hear the Word is so that we can then speak the Word. Right? God sent people to, He spoke the Word so it could be written down so that we could read it and then speak it back to Him. Praise the Lord. So then Ephesians tells us, God has already done something. He hath blessed us. Yes. Has blessed us. Hath. Past tense, right? So when we got born again, when we were born again, we were placed in Christ, right? Amen. And that place is in the heavenlies. Yes. So let's forget this idea about space being heaven. Because it's not. Right. Heaven isn't a geography kind of thing. It's a spiritual reality. There's no, there's no road map there, amen, outside of Jesus, hallelujah. So it's a dimension, it's a, it's a different dimension, it's not a different location in, in, in the sense of uh, going somewhere to get it, amen. So when we're born again, we're placed in Christ, amen, and that place is in the heavenlies, amen. You have heaven in you, you have the kingdom of God in you. That's why to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You're not going to have to go on a long trip. When you shed this thing, you're there. And the truth is we're there now if we can only relate spiritually rather than physically. Amen. So look, Ephesians 1, uh, verses 20 and 21, Sheila. Ephesians 1, 20 and 21. 
So which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. So when we're talking about having your mind renewed to the Word of God, it's more than just memorizing Scripture. It's thinking differently. It's actually dropping this world's way of understanding and moving into another dimension. Think you know, consciously, praise the Lord. Because that's how you manifest it. So, he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand, in heavenly places, far above all principality and the power and might and dominion, and every name that's named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. So, this is telling us the location, amen, of heavenly places. The heavenly places are above or have authority over or priority to, amen, principalities, powers, might, and everything that is named both in heaven and earth, in the world and the world to come. The heavenly is in Christ. See, when we th we're thinking naturally, whenever we see something like above, uh, you know, it's above this, it's above that, we're immediately looking up. And that's not it. It has authority over it. It's above it in the sense that His name is greater than anything else. He's above it. He has control over it. He has power over it. Amen? The heavenly is in Christ. So, we have to operate from that position. Praise the Lord. We have to operate from that inner man, the inner voice, the inner hearing. Praise the Lord, the spirit man. So we have to operate from there. It's the Word of God. It's the Word that comes forth, the inspired Word of God, that changes things. The Word laying here in this book doesn't do a thing until somebody reads it, believes it, and then speaks it. Jesus was the Word made flesh. And he said, I'm only saying what I hear my father say. I'm only doing what I see my father do. And then we go off and have create some religious function that we do instead of doing that. Yeah. That's, that's what he came to show us. Praise the Lord. The sword of the Spirit. Amen. Or the Spirit of his mouth, he says. You and I make war with the enemy the same way by the word of God coming out of our mouth. In the book of Revelations, it says he was on the horse, sword comes out of his mouth, and he defeats all these kings. We talked about some of that last week. That's how we do it. That's how we're supposed to be doing it. The sword comes out of our mouth whenever we speak the word of God. Against any enemies, against any kings that rise up and try to dominate our lives. Yes. Praise the Lord. Just think, think about the spirit of his mouth. Uh, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. God creates man out of the dust of the earth, this, the, the flesh part of us, amen. And then it says he breathes into him the life of God, or the spirit, amen. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul, a living being, praise the Lord. Every time God breathes, every time he exhales, life is the result of the breathing of God. All right? Abram. God puts an H in his name. Abraham. Right? Sarai. God puts an H on the end of her name. She becomes Sarah. God put an H in their names, and when you have an H, you have to exhale. Yes. Yes. H, right? God breathed into them, and a miracle took place. Isaac. Something that couldn't have been done, hadn't been able to do, wouldn't have ever been able to do. Until God breathed life to them. In other words, the Spirit dominated. Praise the Lord. All right, look at Ezekiel. And we've looked at these scriptures before, but I'm just kind of moving towards somewhere here. So Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26 and 27. We get the idea, I mean, I think sometimes we get all hung up in uh, prophecies or prophets without knowing if they're really a prophet or if they're just claiming to be a prophet. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Paul said, I would that you all prophesy. You all have the ability to prophesy. Why? Because you're all kings and priests. But we've relegated this to a handful of people who can then manipulate you instead of you doing it yourself. So this is what God's showing us. A new heart also will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart of your flesh and I'll give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and or walk in my word, amen, and you will keep my word and do the word. Uh -huh. Praise the Lord. 
All right, verse, uh, chapter 37 and verse 1. So I hand of the Lord was upon me, this is Ezekiel talking, he said, he carried me out into the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of a valley which was full of bones. <coughs> Verse 3. <coughs> and he said unto me, son of man, can these bones live? God, how many times have God, has God asked you that? Can you be healed? Can you be prospered? Can this happen? Could that happen? He's asking you, what do you believe? Right. Amen. So he says, I answered, Lord, you know. All right, verse 5. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you will live. All right, verse 9. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from these four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. Verse 10. He's asking Ezekiel to do this. So he, he says, So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood up on their feet, an exceeding great army. Praise the Lord. So when the breath of God comes into that valley, to, to the deadness, amen, to all these dead men's bones, they stood on their feet, amen, an exceeding great army. Why? Because God's breath came into that lower. God is speaking to us today. These are not here to, so that we have a history lesson. They're here to speak to us today, to teach us today. Amen? So John chapter 20, verse 21 through 23. John 20, 21 through 23. Then said Jesus to them, Again, peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. That's for all of us. What God sent Jesus to do, Jesus sent us to be doing the same thing, right? And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive you the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you remit, this is critical, they're remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. You, I mean, imagine what God, the authority that God has given to us. We have the ability to forgive people. And believe me, everybody's going to have a choice at some point. Everybody's going to get the chance to either forgive somebody or retain that against them. Praise the Lord. I'm not saying the behavior's good. I'm not saying what they did, you just, well, who cares? No, I'm saying you still got a choice. You, got, you have to make a choice. And if, if I were to go back and, you know, do an itemized list of my bad behaviors and my sins and everything else, I would not want to be in the position to have to exonerate myself. But God has given us the ability to do that because he has wiped the slate clean on everybody. And then he says, okay, if you'll echo me, if you'll say what I say, because what has God said? Though your sins be as scarlet, amen, they shall be white as snow. He has taken away all our sin. He has been a substitute for everybody's sin, no matter how heinous, no matter how much we don't like it, or how much it might be the one that we hate the most. Exactly. It still has to be dealt with, amen, and He's given us the authority. I think that goes a long way in determining how we operate in the Spirit. Yes. Jesus was willing to forgive everybody, the worst he suffered for them. Now, it's easy to look at the picture of him on the cross and say, well, thank you, Jesus, until you start making an itemized list of the people and the things that happened in the world and how heinous and how horrible and how disgusting and all the rest of it that it is. And yet he knew all of it and then some. And he said, I'll, I'll take it on me. I'll take the curse. I'll take the, the punishment. I'll take the shame. Amen. Praise the Lord. We get to do the same thing. If we're really going to be like Jesus, if we're really going to be like the Lord, here's your opportunity. Yes. Praise God. Acts chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. So he breathed on him and said, Receive the Holy Ghost. Whoever sins you remit. I think it's fascinating that he didn't say, 
whoever you lay hands on recovers, although that was true of all of that. But it's, it's almost like that right there was the epitome of what that authority was about, what the Holy Spirit could mean in a person's life. Amen? So in Acts 2, he says, Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of what? A, mush, a rushing mighty wind, the breath of God, right? And it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them a cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit, amen, gave them utter, utterance. Amen? Now in Thessalonians, it speaks of the Spirit of His mouth, destroying the man of sin. And for those of you that were here uh, last week, I, you know, I was talking about, we talk about the man of sin, the beast, and all that. It's right here. The, the natural man, the unregenerated, unrenewed mind, is like a beast. In fact, he talks about it in the Old Testament. He says, God, I would, in Psalms, he says, I think it's Psalms, or Ecclesiastes, he says, uh, I, I wish that you would reveal to man that he's but a beast. Without being renewed, without being born again, we are simply beasts. We are, have a beast nature. And that's the part of us, I'm not talking about, I, I don't know, Pete, you argue about, uh, you know, two natures and do you have or don't you have. That's, I don't know and I don't really care. All I know is there's a lot of stuff in, up here that didn't get fixed when this got fixed. Yes. When I got born again. There's lots of questions and, and, and goings on in my mind that dr will, will drag me into the natural. It'll cause me to believe stuff I'm seeing instead of what I've read or instead of, instead of what God has said. I'll believe what I'm feeling in my body or what some doctor says or what the lawyer says or somebody else says. You see what I'm saying? That's, that's, the, old, that's the beast nature. And he said that beast is destroyed by, amen, that sword that comes out of his mouth. Yeah. Praise the Lord. We speak the, the spirit of his mouth destroys the man of sin. The Word of God, if you can dominate that old nature, that old way of thinking, amen, Don, we were ta talking about this before church, what is that when guilt or, or shame or something of something happened 50 years ago or 30 years ago or whatever comes, what is that? That's not coming from God, it's not coming from the Spirit, that's coming from the carnal thinking, the, the parts of our mind that haven't let go of it. We thought, we think we have, until we have that quiet moment somewhere and all of a sudden it's like, where did that come from? And then it'll haunt you. Then it just wants to mess with you, right? That's that old nature. That's that beast that we overcome by the word of His Spirit. Yes. His words that I speak, He said, their spirit and their life. Praise God. So we all battle stuff. And the way that we overcome that enemy who happens to be us, happens to be our unregenerated minds or our way of thinking that says you're not going to get the breakthrough, you're not going to get healed, you're not, going to, you're not ever going to uh, you know, have the, the promise that God gave you. It's not going to happen for you because you're too screwed up. You're too, you, you, you've done this and you've done that. All those things come back to try to keep us from doing and saying what God says. To get us to say something contrary to what God says. We oppose ourselves, the scripture says in one place. Praise the Lord. So, the breath of God is what slays the wicked one. The breath of God is what brings deliverance. Life for death. Amen. Victory for defeat. Healing for sickness. Prosperity for poverty. Provision for lack. That's how it happens. That's how it works. 1 Thessalonians uh, 4, verses 16 and 17. 1 Thessalonians 4. 16 and 17. Now everything in the Bible, there's a truth. It's all true. I'm not, saying, I'm not questioning the truth of it. I'm saying that there are depths. There are layers. There are, because we all, we've talked about this many times. We've all read scriptures. And then we read them five years later. And of course, whatever it said the first time, it still says. It's still true. Right. But we see something now that's beyond that. Because of the circumstances, because of experiences, or whatever it is, all of a sudden, or we have greater expectation of God. So we see something more. Doesn't, doesn't disavow the thing that was already there, just that it opens up more to us. So, for the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with Him in the clouds 
to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Praise the Lord. So the word here that's used, the word shout, is a Greek word. That Greek word is kalousma, and it's a war cry. It's a, it's a military term. It means to call to war. Amen? So this isn't just future. I mean, there's going to be a literal appearing. I'm not questioning that. I'm not denying that. There will be a literal appearing of the Lord. Amen? But before that literal appearing, there has to be an appearing of the Lord in us. Praise the Lord. He is descending right now into our lives. Everything we've read about the Holy Spirit, by the Word, He comes. He, he, he comes into us. He, he, the, that's, I mean, come on, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. It's the Spirit of God. Praise the Lord. So He's descending right now into our lives. He's declaring war. We've talked about it this morning, and, and even if this wasn't the case we were dealing with, we all get into battles every day. Or every week there's something that comes to fight against us or to challenge our faith or to, to question who we are in Christ and whether we can see the promises of God fulfilled or whether they won't be and, and all of those kinds of things. There's, it's a war cry, amen, of Jesus. He comes to us, He descends into our lives and He declares war and He calls us to battle against our carnal mind. Yes. Against our unrenewed mind. Yes. Exactly. Praise the Lord. Against the sense realm against this dimension. Yes. Every time we stand on the Word of God, we wield the sword of the Spirit. There's a descending of Jesus, and there's an ascending of us yes. into that heavenly place. Yes. Again, it's not geography we're talking about. It's a position. It's a place in Christ. Mm -hmm. And He is the heavenlies. We've already determined that. And that's what's happening. Praise God. He descends in the voice of the chief messenger. Now, there's a, a messenger, the, the archangel uh, Michael. Look at, look, look at this, Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 through 11. Revelation 12, 7 through 11. So Jesus comes, He descends in the Word. Yes. By the Word, amen? He is the chief messenger. Messenger. He is the Word of God. Yes. Now, throughout the Bible, we see messengers, not the chief messenger, but messengers from God. Think about Daniel when they came. He had a message for Daniel, right? It was a word from God. The angel didn't make it up. He didn't just have something to say. He was carrying a word from God to that circumstance, to that individual in that situation. Amen? So, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they, came, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, <coughs> and by the word of their testimony, yes. and love not their lives unto death. So in another place, this, this is Michael that's speaking this message, right? It's a message from God, it's a word from God, but he's the one that's speaking it, right? In another place, he's at war over the body of Moses. In fact, look at Jude chapter 9, or excuse me, Jude verse 9, there's only one chapter. And yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. So he didn't have, he didn't make up something to say. He just said what God would say. Shut up. Amen. And what was that war about? It was about the body of Moses. It was about the law. Amen. About people, because we're now speaking from the New Testament, what that was projecting to and it was fornication. In fact, it talks about it, fornication. Why? Because they were, they were deviating from one covenant to another. From the law to grace. And back to the law and back to grace. Paul deals with it over and over in the New, in the New Testament. And so they were, they were being unfaithful to God because he has this covenant with them. And they were going back into the other one, which was by works. 
Amen. Not by God, but by their own effort. That's the fight that was going on. And, and it says that Michael the archangel was contending with the devil. He disputed over the body of Moses. What does the devil do? He disputes with you about your condition, your position in Christ. He comes to tell you, well, come on. He may not say the law, but he'll say, you did this, or you didn't do this, or you haven't done that, and you thought this, and you thought that. It's still a contending, amen, for the body of Moses, trying to get you back into a place where you are subject to your, your works, your behavior, your, your uh, doing the right thing, rather than trusting in the finished work of Christ. Right. Praise the Lord. So... Forsaking grace, falling from grace, you back into the law. Michael, so this archangel speaks of the messenger of God, right? But it's not just a messenger, it's a message. He's not just a messenger, he has a message. He brings a message. He brings a word. The chief messenger is Jesus Christ, the word of God. Amen. All the archangel does is bring a word, a message from the chief messenger. Right. Praise the Lord. The chief messenger is Jesus. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 through 4. 2 Corinthians 12, 2 through 4. Now this is fascinating to me because Paul says, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knows. Such one was caught up to the third heaven. Now we've already determined this isn't, he didn't go up in the sky someplace. He moved into another dimension. He moved into the spirit. He was operating in the spirit. So he says, I don't know whether it was, I was in the body or I wasn't in the body. Anybody ever had one of those things where you're just totally out of it for a little bit? You're just so in sync with God that you don't know what's really real and what isn't real. What's physical and what isn't physical, in other words. So he's such a one caught up into the third heaven, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot, t cannot tell. God knows. How that he was caught up into paradise. What do we already said? Jesus is the heavenlies. Amen. And heard unspeakable words. He heard words from God. Amen. Which is not lawful for a man to utter. So it had to be God saying it because nobody else knew this stuff. Right? Right? All right, so this is what he's saying. We're not talking about geography, but when he descends and begins to declare the word, a message to us, the word is appropriated into our lives. There's a descending of the Lord, and that message comes with that. Amen. And then there's an ascending of us, and that's what Paul's talking about. Just think about, Paul had this revelation. Nobody had it. They'd seen all the Old Testament. They'd read it for years and years and years, and yet Paul had this revelation. He heard something from God that nobody else had heard, even though they were all reading the same book. He had moved, amen, from this physical realm into the heavenly, into Christ. He had a revelation from Jesus Christ, who had died, by the way, and been crucified and was raised again. Yeah. Nobody else saw Jesus on the road to Damascus but Paul. Right. He had an encounter. Praise the Lord. He moved out of this dimension into the spirit dimension. We see it over and over in the Bible. You'll see it all the time in the Old Testament too because these people, they didn't have the spirit of God. So God would move upon them with the spirit. Praise God. So when he descends, he begins to declare the word. And then when we appropriate that word or believe in that word or stand on that word or act on that word, what happens? That dimension becomes a reality here. I think of Don and Jane. What? God said something to you. It may not have been, you know, something you could quote from the scripture, but you knew it was God, right? Because you had this inner sense. A message had come. When you acted on the message, the result was miraculous. Yes. Yes. Right? You ascended. You, see, a miracle is simply a suspension of time and what goes on in time. A miracle is something from another dimension. It's not a miracle in heaven. It's not a miracle in the heavenlies. It's only a miracle in time. It's only a miracle here. Right. You see what I'm saying? So anytime we have breakthrough, that's what's happened. He has descended with a message. He's given us a word or something, and we've appropriated it. We've grabbed a hold of it and said, I'm not letting go of this. And what happens is we get lifted up. We get ascended. We get into Christ where the miracles are, where everything is. Now, that's not to say that he isn't with us all the time. But again, 
Only to the degree our mind is renewed to it. When we're not thinking that, we're just as carnal as anybody else. Praise the Lord. So, there's a descending when He gives the Word, and there's an ascending when we receive the Word, when we appropriate it. All right, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10. And see, this is why, I think this is why we, you know, we, it's easy for us to look in the book of Revelation and other scriptures for that matter and, and push them off and say that's just too spiritual, it's too weird, it's too something. But these, this is who we are, this is what we really are. But when we, when we make it into something weird, it's not the truth, it's something else. It's, it's, we're missing this, the, the, the truth of what God's trying to say. In other words, we go all through here and there's, there's parables, there's metaphors, there's types and shadows everywhere, all through the Bible. And then, I've said this before, then we get to the book of Revelation, and although we've understood these to be metaphors and, and types and shadows and symbolism and all sorts of things, we get to the book of Revelation, now all of a sudden, everything is literal. No, there's still types here. There's still revealings that, are, that have to be looked at by the Spirit. Because what happens is, when you look at it in the flesh, when you look at it naturally, it's overwhelming. It's like, it, how does that relate to Jesus? It doesn't. It becomes just some big horror show. But in fact, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the culmination of the first 65 books. So it ought to be a reflection of that. It ought to be giving us a clear insight into that rather than taking us off into some Alice in Wonderland freak out, you know. Smoking caterpillars and the whole thing, right? I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day and I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Okay, so... This is John, the revelator, the one that writes this from the message that Jesus gives him. And he's in the spirit, right? He's in the spirit, and he hears a trumpet, all right? 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 8. We said what the breath of God was. It's a call. When Jesus comes, it's a call. When he descends, we ascend, and it's a, a cry when, when he calls out, you hear a shout, it's a trumpet, is actually what that translates. There's a, there's a trumpet sound, and what does it say? Come up. He's descending, we are ascending. John says, I was in the Spirit, and I heard a trumpet. Now what does he say? For if the trumpet, this is what Paul said, if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who's going to prepare himself for the battle? So there's all kinds of trumpets, but they're not all Jesus. <laughs> Praise the Lord. There's all kinds of people say, I'm a prophet. Here's a prophet. I'm telling you, everybody that claims to be a prophet is not a prophet. It's not my job to determine who they are. My job is to just obey God, and if their prophecy lines up, great. If it doesn't, just forget about it. I'm going to tell you a story. I've told this before probably, but it fits here so clearly. When I was just getting into the ministry, I was in my mid-30s, and uh, we were still in East Texas. There was an old preacher by the name of Barnes. I want to say T.W., but it was T-something Barnes. And he had a, a, a real miraculous ministry. A lot of healings, all kinds of things like that. And uh, he'd had a tent burnt down. He was telling me this story. And he was, at the time, he was an old man. About my age. <laughs> no, he was probably about 80. He wasn't, you know, he was made 10 years older than me. He's really old then, but not so old now. But anyway, he said he'd had this tent. They, they were having tent revival. This is back in the probably in the 30s, somewhere thereabouts. And uh, they had burnt the tent down. They hated Pentecostals in a lot of places back in those days. And uh, somebody set the tent on fire. And so he got this farmer to loan him his barn for the service that night. And he was, uh, they had cleaned the barn out. And uh, somebody, he had had this banner made. And it said, T.W. Barnes Healing Ministry. And so he had it strung up there on the barn, across the front of the barn. And he said he was sitting under a tree, just kind of looking at it and relaxing a little bit because the service wasn't going to be until that evening. And he said, the Lord spoke to me as clear as I've ever heard, heard the Lord, he said. And I said, what did he say? And he said, T.W. Barnes, healing ministry. Never heard of it. And he said, I got up and tore the sign down and never put up another one. If we're in the Spirit... It's Jesus that does the healing. And this is the point I'm trying to make. Whenever we elevate certain people, we diminish everybody else. 
because we all have the same spirit. We all have the same anointing. We all have Jesus. So therefore, you are a miracle worker. You are a prophet. Now, whether you understand that or act on it, that's a question of getting your mind renewed to the truth of God's word. But until the body of Christ rises up into this revelation, we have minimized God to a handful of people. God can only move where those people are. You see what I'm saying? How is the glory of God going to fill the earth unless the body of Christ rises up and begins to function in that glory, begins to operate in Christ? Amen. It's easier to just say, well, you know, brother so-and-so's got this gift. No, brother so-and-so's got nothing that you don't have. He's just identified it and started doing something with it. And everybody else then has to wait for brother so-and-so to show up when God's right there all the time. So I'm not against prophet. I think people think sometimes, well, he, he's just jealous. No, I'm, it's not that. I'm not against them doing what they do. I'm just saying, if, if we don't rise up to that same reality, we're making fools of ourselves and God. And we're making people think that you have to have some special thing, and you don't. They don't have one lick more than what you've got of Jesus. They just I've had identified it. We all know, we, we all have known prophets and, and, and great ministries that were flawed. The man was flawed. But God still worked tremendous miracles in their lives. I mean, you can go back to David in the Old Testament, but I mean, even in our lifetimes. Because God has delivered them, and God wants to work through them, and He'll, he'll work through anybody if they'll make themselves available. I've told this before too, but I'll, I'll tell it again. I'm not going to tell you the church, but I happened to be in this church. It was back when we had the flood here, and we had the basement was gutted. We didn't have any bathroom for a week or two. We had to get some uh, kaibos, some you know, porta potties out here, until we had the basement finished. And as you guys would know, remember. But for one week at least, we didn't have those toilets yet, and so we everybody just went where they had to, wherever they wanted to go. And I don't mean to the bathroom. I mean to wherever they wanted to go to church because we didn't have a service that day. So we, Sally and I went to a particular church, and it was kind of weird because they handed out these little things that said, do not minister. Do, no one except we have a specific ministry team that ministers. Well, I wouldn't have done anything unless I was really had a tremendous unction from the Lord. I'm not the kind of person that goes to somebody else's church and then starts doing stuff, you know, unless God would really move on me to do something. So... But I thought it was kind of weird, but I understand it was a bigger church, and I suppose they're thinking, you know, if everybody gets up here and starts doing this, it'll be chaos. Well, that's called revival. You know, we call it chaos, but that's really what revival is, when everybody begins to operate in the gifts, when everybody starts doing what they are capable of doing. And will there be error or mistake? Of course there will, because we're human. But that's not a reason to not do it. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not afraid of mistakes. I've made enough of them. They've become traditions for me. Praise the Lord. I'm just saying, we, you can't be afraid to make a mistake or you won't do anything. Exactly. And God's bigger than my mistakes. He can fix the mistakes. He can get me back on track if I screw it up. Right. But if I'm not willing to step out, He can't do anything. He's stuck. So, then at the, before the service, they had this, like six people. The pastor and five people. And they were all uh, the ministry team. The only ones that could pray, the only ones that could lay hands on people, the only ones that could prophesy, the only ones who could interpret tongues and so on and so forth, right? Well, it was interesting because very little happened, which is not surprising because you only had five people. Instead of 400 operating, you had four. So God just got shrunk down from 400 possibilities to five. This little girl, they had just come back from a uh, missions trip to Africa. And... Uh, one of the girls, they were all preteens. They were like 10, 11, 12 years old. And they saw miracles. They had prayed for people, and I, blind eyes were open. The lame walked. I mean, they saw some miraculous things happen by their own hand, what they were doing, what they were doing. And the little girl said, I'll never forget, she said, The Lord spoke to me and said, The only requirement is that you believe. And I thought, Out of the mouths of babes, here's a 10 or 11 year old that knows more than the whole ministry here. And that's not to rebuke them. I'm just saying, there. it was an organization, and organizations have rules, and you have a hierarchy, and you, it, whatever, it rolls downhill, and you've got to go along with it, or you're out. I get that. But that little girl spoke more wisdom than I heard in the entire service. 
she saw it. You couldn't take that away from her. She saw what God would do through a kid who probably had such a small understanding of theology, but she understood enough of God that he wanted to move, that he saw somebody blind, he wanted them to be able to see. He saw somebody crippled, he wanted them to be able to walk. Right. Praise the Lord. So, when he descends and begins to declare the word or gives a message to us into our lives, there's this descending of the Lord and a ascending of us. The word of God is a more sure word of prophecy than anybody. You, you know how to find out if it's the word of God. You know how to find out if it's a, a word for you. If it's in here. But think about it. If it's in here, what did you need them to tell you for? Does that man or that woman have more authority to you or for you than God himself? Because that's the word right here. Now, it's nice to have an, a confirmation or an affirmation from somebody. But the truth is, this ought to be enough. Yes. Yes. Right? When, when Thomas couldn't believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, he had a word from the Lord, but he couldn't believe it. Right. So Jesus said, okay, stick your hand in here. Feel the wound, so on and so forth, right? And he said, you're blessed because now you know something that you didn't know before. But greater are those who haven't seen and believe. That would be us. Who never saw it, but we have the record of it. We have a message from Him about it. We have awesome potential. So there, there's lots of trumpets sounding today. But when it's a word from the Lord, there is literally a descending of the Lord and ascending of the saints. We all watch some Christian TV. i got to tell you, it ain't all God. Unless there's a descending of Jesus and not some ascending of some guy or gal. It's when there is a descending of the Lord, there is an ascending of the saints, of the people of God. Amen. Revelation 10 and verse 7. Now this is fascinating because this, this encapsulates everything that I'm talking about. And and what we really need to understand. We have been placed in Christ. We are in the heavenlies. If we know it. If we have our minds renewed to that. We're there all the time. All the time that we're conscious of it. Or that we're aware of it. Or that we're speaking that. Right? So he says here. In the days of the voice of the seventh angel. When he shall begin to sound. The mystery of God shall be finished. As he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Okay, what mystery? I'll tell you what mystery. Colossians 1, 26 and 27. Even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The day we rise up. See, we have a lot to say about this stuff. We think it's all written down somewhere in stone. No, it's, it's, a lot of it has to do with this generation rising up as God has said we can or that we're capable of. And whatever generation that is, is going to put an end to that mystery. Yeah. Yeah. Praise the Lord. There's going to be such a manifestation and a revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ out of the life of His people that it won't be a mystery anymore. It'll be a manifestation. We've seen it. All of us have seen little pictures of that. We've seen isolated cases of it. We've seen it in our own lives and other people's lives. We've seen Jesus manifest. He's the healer. He's the, you know, whatever the thing is. That's a revelation of Jesus. Somehow we got aware, amen, of our place in the heavenly. That He is the heavenly. Amen. And where heaven is, we know everything else is. Your healing, your deliverance, it's all done. Amen. So we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. That word, the Greek word there, is ah, ah, air. Amen? And it means to breathe unconsciously. Think about everything we've talked about here. The breath of God. The Holy Spirit. Right? He said you're going to be caught up into an unconscious breath. 
And one, one translation is to blow air. What does God do when He brings life? Yeah. He breathes into His people. Yeah. Every time God breathes, life results. Yes. They which are alive and remain will be caught up, and those that are dead will be made alive. I'm not, I'm not arguing with the truth of the literal fulfillment of that sometime out in the future, but I'm saying there, it's, there's a doing of this right now that He wants us to understand. Because to have that, we've got to have it here first. It has to be in us before it can be everywhere else. Exactly. All Scripture is God-breathed. Yes, it is. It is. Every time He breathes, there's life. There's God life. There's the miraculous. We're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the breath of the Lord. Yes. Praise God. Wow. Yeah. We're caught up in Him as He brings the changes in our life. Sure. When we see manifestations, all of a sudden we're caught up in the Lord. We're <laughs> with Him. Yes. We're, we're connected. Amen. There has to be a catching up of our spirit man elevated into his presence, into his likeness through his breathing on us. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Once this thing gets renewed, if we could ever get to the place where it was in agreement with this, we'd forever be with the Lord. There'd never be a question in our mind, is he with me? Is he for me? Right? Because we know everything in here tells us that. Yes. It's this natural mind that the devil tries to mess with to get us not to believe what he's already told us. Right. So instead of getting God's breath or God's life, we're sucking death. Yeah. Flesh. All right, we'll, we'll quit with this. First John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. First John 3, 1 and 2, last scripture, praise God. So think about all that we've talked about here. And then he says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God, or the image of God. Therefore the world doesn't know us, because it didn't know Him. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Right now. And we know that we are. But that's what he's telling us. And it doesn't appear yet what we shall be. Because, because why? Because we can't get this thing to cooperate. Right? But when He appears, when He descends... We know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. Because yeah. we'll see Him as He is. Exactly. When we agree with this, we see Him as He is. And we are conformed to that image. When you look into the mirror, He said, yes. beholding your face, it is transformed into His image, amen, by the Spirit or by the breath of God, by the Word of God. Yes. Problem is, another scripture He says, but we walk away and forget what manner of man we are. Yes. Forgetting what he says. And start listening to our own heads again. Yeah. And allowing the devil to manipulate us. You see what I'm saying? We have, we have it now. Yeah. We can be the ones to determine this. But we've got to go to war. And it's too easy to not go to war. It's too easy to just put it off till, hey, I'm going to heaven at some point. And you will. But you won't see heaven here except when you do this, when you are willing to go to war. When you hear the battle cry, when you hear the word of God, you go, Here am I, Lord, send me. That's, that's what they're talking about, right? Yes. I'll take up the sword. Yes. And you'll always be victorious. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Praise God. <laughs> amen, amen. Praise God. The beauty of it is, each one of us can do this, even if nobody else wants to. Yeah. You can still do it. You have the choice. Praise God. God bless all of you. Appreciate you very much. Continue to be in prayer for that entire situation, and uh, we just believe God's moving, and it's all going to be good in Jesus' name. Have a great week. God bless you all. Springs Tuesday, I think. So, yeah, I'm sure we'll have a little inclement weather just to...